versatile, they are dedicated. They are true professionals. They're New Zealand firefighters. Whether volunteers or career firefighters, they're prepared to put their lives on the line day in, day out. To find out what this extraordinary life is like, our cameras are with them 24-7 as they answer emergency calls. Papakura Fire Station south of Auckland. Station officer Phil Beach and his crew, Papakura Red Watch, are getting ready to work out. They need to be fit to cope with whatever their job demands. In the next 48 hours, Phil's crew will take part in a major house burn exercise, and that requires peak fitness. Even at the gym, they carry pages, and during their shifts, they stick together, always. They never know when the emergency calls will come in. Noticed a huge improvement in the guys, just in muscle development and and um, general fitness and that. Of course, Regan's a bit of a pro at it, and he's been doing his sessions that we come here from the from shift. And some days he'll have even started before shift and come again after shift. So, what are you, what are you about to lift me? Uh, just two twenty. Yeah. Shh, position to bed. Because Regan and Mike are both rookies, there's a healthy rivalry between them. Yeah, going light today, Regan. Just, just, <laughs> just a light day, is it? Mike? <laughs> Emergency calls don't fit themselves around Papakura Red's schedule. The guys have only just worked up a sweat when the pages go off. There's an electrical fire at a quarry. Okay, unlock everybody. <laughs> Nearly all 111 calls to the fire service are answered in less than eight seconds. Changing from their gym gear doesn't slow the firefighters down much either. It takes less than half a minute. We're going to back up Manicure. They've got a, um, a portacom building in the quarry on fire. It's non-reticulated, so there's no water. Apparently the portacom is some sort of substation that's got electrical cabling and wires and stuff in it. When you get electrical appliances burning, particularly high voltage transformers, you get a lot of sparking and things blowing up. Oh yeah, still chugging it out. Port of Cop building, approximately 20 metres by 3 metres, turning in high voltage, electrical switch gear on fire. This is a sort of fire where no one will actually be going inside it, I shouldn't think. The first problem we've got is that the whole building is aluminium, so if any of the uh, electrical equipment that's on fire in there has actually broken down to the point where cables are touching on the outside of the building, then the whole building theoretically could be live. We've got 11,000 volts coming in on these um, big transformers at the back. There's more than enough amps in there to zap anyone. Firefighting instinct is to throw water at the flames, but water conducts electricity, so they have to be cautious. A light spray called fog is used. Hey, fog only! Fog only! Fog only! You got some cabling above you guys too. Yeah. Just stand back and just keep it above it so it just cools it around it. There's always a danger of oh, yeah. um, putting water into anywhere that's got electricity. You can reduce the danger by making the water particles smaller, which is what the guys are doing. They're working with a fog delivery rather than a straight jet delivery. We're going to wait till the um, power board arrives. They will isolate the subs and then offer uh, their expert advice on just how we can proceed. At this stage, we're staying out of the building. And there's no water at the quarry no hydrants on site. There is a water tanker and Phil has to make sure he coordinates its use with their own supply so they don't run out. The only way we can use this one is with our portable pump off our truck in the top into that. We'll see how we go with our tanker. There's all the smoke just here coming from the other end burning. From the other end, there's a room off the side you can't get into anyway, so it might be that part of it as well. Is there anything burning? Well, it's dropped down. We could. Actually, I'll get the tech back. 
tick. Don't grab yeah. the tick. Yeah. The tick or thermal imaging camera will show the heat levels inside and maybe where the seat of the fire is. Sees the burning through all the smoke and all that. They can't actually see in there what's what's burning or what's going on. You see anything, Phil? Yeah, it's not actually burning down the sense burning at the other end. Basically what the tick is doing is it's showing that in each corner of the building where you can see smoke staining and smoke coming out from the, the cracks and the cladding, it's showing up that there's heat there, but there's no one actual heat source, so it's probably heat coming through from the other room rather than this room itself being on fire. Because it's a serious blaze, District Chief Fire Officer Larry Cocker turns up to assess the situation. Actually, with the juice on, it wouldn't even be safe standing on the floor. The, element, the whole floor's aluminium, by the look of it. Yeah. I'll give you a bit of a pickle up. So I'm not going to stand in there. Well, yeah, put your foot down. Yeah. yeah. No, you're the boss. You put your foot down. Ah. <laughs> you get paid more than me. Yeah, <laughs> I wish. But they don't have to worry. The electricity company arrives to switch off the power, which means they can finally get on with putting out the fire. Yeah, just sort of in here and then up there, but watch it'll cloud all over the place and you won't see shit all. That's it, just work it like that. Phil tries to save the wiring from further water damage. He sends Regan in with a dry powder extinguisher. Right on the uh, You'll need, um, you need another one. There's another one over there. But the powder won't do it. There's too much heat still being generated, and a high pressure water delivery is needed to finish the job. 307, can you crank up the high again? Yeah, we'll do it. Just have a, how much water you got out of that? Oh, that'll be enough anyway. It's a mess. The fire and water damage together will make it hard for investigators to determine what caused the blaze. The whole of the inside of that first cabinet which were um, crusher electrical controls from the uh, 11,000 down to 400 volts were completely destroyed. There's just a mountain of copper and, and um, big fuses and all sorts of stuff. Other than that, we'll um, recommission our truck, we'll load up the tank with, with some more water since we've used a bit, and uh, we'll go live on air for the next one. It's been a two hour operation at the quarry. Papakura Red Watch heads home for dinner. Don't chuck on mine if you can. Hey? Don't put on mine. Okay. While they're on duty, firefighters eat together as well. Usually it's at the station, but Mike lives just around the corner. One, two, three, four. It's a bonus being able to eat out. And for Mike, there's a precious half hour with his family. Hi. Dinner's only just finished when they're called to a house fire. Just uh, be told by the control room that they've had another call come in and that it's likely that there's a large bomb fire going beside this house rather than the house being on fire. The communication centre's right. It is a bomb fire, but it's prompted worried neighbours to call 111. Did you get a false call, did you? Oh, no, we got a call to yeah, our house on fire. Oh, it's a clean burner, eh? Oh, well, we've got the right guys here, anyhow. <laughs> Phil checks around the property to make sure the fire can't spread. The owner knows he should have had a permit to light a bonfire. He's embarrassed by having the fire service turn up to his party. We've done this for 10 years, mate. It's just my daughter's brought her friends over and we're just um, enjoying the heat of the fire and we're just about, when it dies down, we're going to light those fireworks. All right. Gotta go, guys. It's just as well the bonfire doesn't take long to attend. The crew's needed at another fire in another part of South Auckland. Whereabouts is it? Be your real road. Be your real road. Let's rock on then. The firefighters of Papakura Red Watch have just left one fire and are heading straight to another. We're going to a call to smoke showing in the area of the golf course. Um, it could be smoke from a rubbish fire or it could even be a building that's on fire. We don't really know until we get there. Oh, is there something emanating from over there? Yeah, that oh, looks like that. Yeah. That's it, alright. 
rubbish fire in the trees. Grab the bolt cutters, guys, and um, do the gate. Firefighters have special powers to enter properties on fire, even if they have to cut their way in. I don't fancy going over the top of this fence because it's got razor wire on it, so we'll cut the padlock. It looks like they've got some mouldy old rubbish fire going. You're not supposed to have a fire after the hours of darkness. It seems that contractors cleaning up the golf course have tried to burn off waste vegetation. Kempers will fray before this job's over. Here we are, that pile of dirty, stinking old rubbish out the back, smouldering away. And so this fire will smoulder on for days, if not weeks, if something isn't done about it. Using water on the fire will only cause more smoke and tie up the crew when they could be needed somewhere else. Phil decides the best option is to call up the contractor whose digger is still on the site and get him to bury the fire. Get on the cell phone and get him out of bed, Mike, and tell him we want him down at his digger now. When the contractor arrives, Phil's patience has worn thin. Good morning. Yeah, <laughs> it could have been. But he's not the only one who's unhappy about turning out here in the middle of the night. Jesus. But since I had to come all the way from the shore down here just to put a fire out, quite amazing, really. If it's a shitty job, they always get me to do it for some reason. As you can see, the digger's busy putting the fire out. What he'll do is... Um, he'll scrape all the embers and burning stumps and things out of the ground and um, then just cover them with a layer of soil and that'll be the end of this fire. We're lucky actually, really quite lucky with this one that we could contact the driver and, um, and get him down here to, to put it out. Sorry, we wake up. Oh, you fixed the replay? With the digger doing the firefighting, that leaves the firefighters to do the paperwork. You're writing a story once upon a time. Thank you, Sonic. <laughs> <laughs> no, oh, thank you. That's good. That's good. I say, no, I see. That's a scummy ass driver. <laughs> oh, I see Michael Johnson. <laughs> when the next day shift arrives, they know what sort of fire they'll be attending. There's a training exercise involving a number of crews at a controlled house burn. Any chance to practice what they call fire attack is invaluable experience. I've organised Papatoe's fire engine to come down. Their area can be covered by other stations fairly easily, so they can be plucked out of the area and put to places that are hard to cover. And we're a hard to cover station, because our nearest backup being Manukau is 10 minutes away. And in 10 minutes, fire's on the ground, you know. We're actually going to burn two houses down. One's a two-storey house and the other's a single-storey house. I haven't seen them yet to know what sort of condition they're in, but apparently the two-storey house um, is not very stable. The houses they'll be using have been donated by a member of the public who wants them removed. They actually come up quite regularly with people offering houses. Um, if someone offered me a house to burn, I'd have to go and have a look at it and make sure that it, if we burnt it, it wasn't going to burn the neighbour's house or, or any other property anywhere near it. Then I'd have to make sure that I had enough water to put it out. And the reason that why I wanted to do it would have to be valid enough to be weighed up against the risk of putting guys into a burning building, even for training. Operational planning officer Roy Breeze has organised the exercise. This house here obviously has been stripped down quite a lot. We've got lots of fire loading underneath, but basically it's fairly unsafe because we've got holes in the floor upstairs. So we're back, there'd be no internal attack on this house, and we really actually want to just stick it on the deck as quickly as possible. There'll be a series of burns. Engineers will monitor heat levels, the speed at which the fire spread, any data that can be used to improve fire service technique and technology. Do you want Mark to be pump up or do you want to be pump up? I'll, I'll go, go for it. Yeah, actually, it probably wouldn't hurt Mike because he hasn't, he hasn't sort of no, got good. his teeth into anything yet. Suits me, mate. Really yeah. yeah, it's a good place to make cock ups anyway. He's only wearing sunglasses to hide the tears. The tears from not enough fires. Yeah. Tommy lessons are free here. Smoke gets in your eyes. <laughs> 
first, they'll set fire to a TV set to demonstrate the dangers of toxic fumes. We're finding a lot of fires um, in houses resulting from, possibly from TV sets or things around the television setting fire to the TV quite early on. And the thing about television sets is they give off an awful lot of really dark, nasty, toxic smoke. So really what we're hoping to show here is the fact that if you don't have a smoke alarm in the room, you could find the smoke will be right down to ground level and make it very, very hard to survive in that room in a very, very short period of time when the fire is actually not particularly big. The fire will probably still be confined to the back of the TV, but the smoke layering can be right down to ground level. Within three minutes, the whole house is full of toxic smoke and any occupants sleeping in other rooms would be lucky to get out alive. And you can see the air being sucked into the fire, just how much air the fire is using now to burn. The house is left to burn for the next exercise, which will demonstrate to the rookies what can go wrong if you attack a fire from the wrong side. There can be serious consequences if you don't do it right. When you attack it from the wrong side, effectively what you do is you push the fire ahead of you into areas that haven't been burnt. Um, and you can even create a situation where you can push the fire into where firemen are by mistake. The wind can have a huge effect on the way a fire burns in a property and what we want to do is stop the wind overcoming what we're trying to achieve. The exercise also shows how fires behave depending on how you apply water to them. Firefighting requires exact procedures, right down to using the right settings on the hoses. The water will come in, cause literally a steam explosion, and it'll blast out, and if anyone was work, walking around in this hallway, if there was people still alive in the house, or firemen doing a search, it will actually make it so hot that it will cause quite serious burns to their skin, because steam burns is one of the worst burns you can get. OK, so you ready? Come put it out. Attacking the fire from the wrong side with the wrong size spray coming out of the hose proves Roy's point. Scalding steam and huge clouds of toxic smoke would be enormously dangerous in a real firefight. In this exercise, the crew has to back off. The whole upper ceiling space of the house is not far off what we call flashover. It's completely filled with gases that are all ready to burn. Everything is heated up to a point where it's all ready to start burning as well. Just needs the mixture right for the air, just needs a little bit more heat. Very soon it'll just go boom and the whole place will be a, just a ball of orange flame from end to end. The two-story house has served its purpose. It's shown the rookies what not to do when attacking a fire from the outside but firefighters face their biggest dangers inside buildings. The next part of the exercise will show them how to cope in the middle of a big fire. Papakura Red Watch firefighters are with other Auckland crews on a training exercise. The next one is called Interior Attack, rescuing people from burning buildings. This is a mattress fire, could have been caused by a number of reasons, such as a cigarette. Um, a lot of trouble we have actually is with people having candles beside their bed. This sort of thing can happen and where people have been drinking, they, um, they won't wake up to this. So you can see the smoke that's built up already, that's fairly lethal sort of smoke out there and it's going to mushroom its way down onto us. Now the whole room's starting to heat up. All of that gas in the air is really acrid on the stroke. You can see it's working its way down, that's why we try to te teach people to crawl low in smoke. And all the smoke as it gets hotter, it becomes flammable and it's really just like having petrol fumes. This is a training exercise, but it's also a common scenario and could just as well be a real emergency. A high percentage of house fires start in a bedroom when the occupants are asleep. Okay, get the crew ready up there. We've got a rookie going to come down the hallway for his first squirt. Hello. Mark, the more experienced, just hold fire, guys. We're just waiting till it goes. Just watch what's going on above you. Just keep up. It's if over 500 degrees. What you can't see is there's flames rolling out the doorway now in the smoke above you. Any person inside this house would either be unconscious or be very close to being dead at this stage. The conditions in there to survive would be untenable. Um, the fire isn't consuming everything, but where it isn't, there is so much toxic smoke that you wouldn't be able to breathe. In a situation like this, the only way to get out would be to call along the floor and straight out the nearest door. 
This is a controlled burn, but in a real call-out, it could look even worse than this. It's been a fierce encounter. The firefighters have learned more, and they've been given a useful reminder that fire doesn't distinguish between a training exercise and a real emergency. Even some of the experienced firefighters needed reminding that when you go in, you go low. Well, for you guys that haven't been in fires for a while, it's not good enough to be standing up. It's not good enough to be on your knees. You've got to be on the floor. I was, you, I was off the scale, you're 500 degrees, and that was rolling in around you. Doesn't, didn't even feel warm. Yeah, well... It was like I'm warm myself, but yeah, didn't it didn't feel hot. It was, it was too dangerous, too hot, too, too, you were too high for it. All right. I had a rookie burnt last week, the week before. He was standing in it. Not so much the flame, but when you open up and you get a good steaming, that's when you're not. Got some good flashovers going, and particularly in the house. Uh, we got it pretty hot for the rookies, put them in there and didn't have any injuries, which was uh, really good. We're quite a tight team now, they um, pretty much know, everyone knows what's happening and makes it all fit together and um, yeah we gel pretty well. Get in there and get the job done, it's excellent. Hey mate. <laughs> yep, have a good day. Next week on Firefighters, Chris Scott and the crew of New Zealand's busiest fire station are faced with a chaotic start to the weekend in central Auckland. Uh, car fire. Down, halfway downtown, so it's down Lawn Street. That's next week on Firefighters. <laughs>